Notes from the second Arctic Science Ministerial, especially the observing related um, readouts. Uh, we're going to hear from some people who either attended or participated in um, either pre meetings or at the science forum itself uh, and see what some of the um, key takeaways and indications were from those efforts and how this group can. Uh, continue this sense of developing actions to respond to these kinds of takeaways. Um, Meredith, if you don't mind scrolling down a little bit further, directly following that, um, because we know that actions usually need funding um, and that the kinds of things that came out of the ministerial are of a scope that really do need uh, support through proposals. We're going to ask Roberto to walk us through the navigating the new Arctic opportunity, which really has some uh, some nice language in there uh, that in terms of uh, how it's constructed for supporting these kinds of efforts. And then uh, we're going to turn to just more of a dialogue based uh, discussion of all of the above um, and some brainstorming as well. Uh, so with that, um, I will jump right in and it's to me to put the context up. So Meredith, maybe if I could share my screen for a moment. And where did my control go? So I'll start by sharing a document which we're going to post on the collaboration site shortly. I apologize that it didn't get posted there yet. So the second Arctic Science Ministerial took place in Berlin on the 25th and 26th of October. Um, the, the document here uh, is a really nice summary that was pulled together um, by the, the group who coordinated the event. And it, cre it, it provides both nice summaries of each of the three themes of the ministerial. Um, and some of the key deliverables, uh, but it also gives a little bit of the shape of the event itself. Um, I really recommend, in particular, the science summary um, on integrating, sustaining, uh, in strengthening, integrating, and sustaining Arctic observations as of relevance for this group. The other themes on understanding regional and global dynamics and assessing vulnerability and building resilience were also really well put together. And, um, and those summaries are, are equally worth reading, but uh, are taken up by other, by other uh, IARPIC teams. Um, so it was a two day event. Uh, there was, the first day was a science, a science forum um, where science delegates from each of the participating countries in the Arctic Science Ministerial and organizations like IASC, IASA, um, and, uh, and SEON participated. Um, and then the second day was the ministers themselves um, who convened and uh, discussed what their national actions are going to be to support these, uh, the kinds of things that were discussed in the science forum and in the science summary. Uh, it was at uh, it was in in concert with the science ministerial that the new navigating the new Arctic opportunity hit the streets um, as well and and there were other uh, U.S. deliverables, many of which are summarized um, in the science document as well that you can read up on. Um, so I think many people have heard about this already. I won't go into too much more detail, um, but maybe turn to. Hayo and Peter, who I believe go next on our agenda to give a readout of a meeting that was hosted the day before the science forum meeting. Uh, who, who do you want to have go first? Uh, Peter, should, should I just start? I, I've got a few slides with some key points and then maybe you can complement those. Yeah, I'm not going to present slides. So if you want to go through your deck, and then I might just make a few comments after from my experience there. Yeah, that's great. Um, and I'm going to share the uh, my uh, slide deck here, Meredith, uh, if I can get that to come up. So um, the, uh, the meeting that I'm reporting on is a uh, was a meeting that was um, co-sponsored by the European Commission's Joint Research Center. They had been um, 
or sorry, let, let, let's, let's take a step back. So, so uh, Arctic Science Ministerial, Sandy already mentioned there were a number of side events that helped inform or play off of the, the ministerial itself and, and the, uh, the Arctic Science Forum associated with the ministerial. One of these events um, that Sandy and I were involved in and helped organize, uh, organize focused on uh, a convergence of two sets of activities. One um, was the efforts or were the efforts by a number of countries and say on to look in more detail at the, uh, the value that can be derived from sustained Arctic observations. Um, and the other related to the Arctic Observing Summit in particular this year's summit, and, and, and specifically a call to action with, with very um, specific uh, recommendations or action items. And so these two things uh, nicely complement each other. So we um, jointly organized a meeting on the day before the science forum um, that was titled Towards Roadmap for Coordinated Arctic Observations uh, or Arctic Observing. And the co-sponsors were the European Commission's Joint Research Center, who uh, provided a venue and, and uh, additional support, SEON, um, the International Study of Arctic Change, and um, the Arctic Observing Summit as, as, as an entity. Um, and um, just as a reminder, much of, of this meeting was informed by both the 2016 and 2018 Arctic Observing Summits that zeroed in on uh, the business case for a pan-Arctic observing system. And, and maybe during the, the, the uh, length of this call, that this, this might be another topic to discuss, but I, I think it nicely illustrated how the European Commission and some of the efforts on the European side, including by, by the Finns in their leadership of the Arctic Council now, um, as well as some of the work that had been done through uh, STIPI, um, OSTP, uh, nice, nicely complemented and, and sort of fed into one another. So the meeting that, that uh, we organized, the, the main goal was to bring together different um, organizations or individuals involved with both regional Arctic sustained observations, but also global observing programs, and both take a look backwards and see what was achieved over the course of the past year, in particular with the Observing Summit and other efforts, um, and then um, both help bring into further focus some of the key items that we, we as a broader community felt are important for the, for the science ministers to consider, consider as well as look forward beyond the, the ASM itself and see what, what are some of the uh, most immediate next steps that we should be taking as a broader community to move both along towards the roadmap of Arctic observing, but, but also get to implementation. And so the meeting had two parts. The first one was mostly a look at what had been done in terms of um, demonstrating the value of Arctic observing systems, basically the, the due diligence portion of, of what was then also presented to, in the ministerial meeting, it, it was led off by Peter Schlosser as chair of ISAC, just giving a bit of a, a, a perspective. And then Jason Gallo with Stippy looked at the US effort that, that um, was completed early uh, last year. Um, uh, uh, Serjan Dobricic with the European Commission looked at the outcome of the IMOBAR project that the European Commission had funded through Horizon 2020. That actually put specific numbers on economic benefits. It was a very interesting summary. And then it was also great to see um, two presentations, one by Mikko Strahlendorf with the uh, uh, Finnish Meteorological Institute that looked at expanding the, the, the uh, value tree analysis that Stippi had initiated uh, with, more, with more of a focus under the uh, Finnish chairmanship and a presentation from Japan that looked at um, how uh, Japan now is picking up the, uh, the STIPI framework as well to look at uh, benefits that are particularly relevant to, to them and other Asian countries. And then the, um, the second um, uh, aspect of the meeting was looking forward with two presentations that looked at um, indigenous people's perspectives on um, sustained Arctic observations, community-based monitoring, Carolina Behe with ICC Alaska, 
and um, uh, a speaker from the uh, Alan Abard with the Nunavik uh, uh, Research Center. And, and those were followed by brief highlights from large gro global programs and, and a couple of Arctic efforts um, to look at how to best align some of these regional with global observing efforts. Um, the, the outcome of, of the side meeting was sort of a, a few bullets and a specific statement put together by the participants that was further input into the Arctic Science Ministerial. I've, I've summarized those here. Um, so recognizing that um, um, what, what we have now is already more in, in, in terms of um, the whole observing system than just a mere sum of its parts and we can put actual numbers or, or, or measures of relevance on these pieces, but more importantly, what's needed, what are, what are two key deliverables that the international community would be ready to provide given the, the necessary funding support. One is a roadmap to help put in place an observing system. And then the second is already getting down the, the road uh, of, of implementation, looking at filling critical gaps with, with innovative um, and coordinated op observations. Just for the record, I also put the full statement in here. I'm not going to read that. You can, you can review that on your own. It's posted on the IRPIC uh, website here as well. What are the next steps? Um, the um, one outcome of, of not just the side meeting, but, but the others as well, is that, that it was recognized by all present that the Arctic Observing Summit is, is now mature enough to be transformed from just a meeting every, every other year into an actual process under the purview of SEON to help coordinate and implement key elements, key priorities of, of a sustained observing effort. And um, Sandy already alluded to this. There, there are conversations and already some specific action in place to, to slot the Arctic Observing Summit and, and associate efforts under SEON through the, the Committee on Observations and Networks. And, um, at the same time, there's, there's recognized synergy with indigenous people's efforts and community-based observations in the Arctic, but that needs to be hashed out in a bit more detail, requiring actual co-design and co-production work. And finally, um, the, the global programs, in particular GEO, but also others, are now ready to engage more substantively with the Arctic research community. I think we're starting to see the first steps of that as well, and, and that's something that others on the call can speak to as well. Final point is, Sanya already mentioned this, um, uh, falling in, in line with, with, with the summary, there's a, uh, a small get together that we're hosting under the umbrella of the AOS Working Group 2 implementation, Sunday 9th of December at AGU, you can see that here. Uh, I think that's all I have. I, I'd hand it over to Peter for additional comments. Great, thank you, Hayo. Um, I think you did a great job of summarizing uh, what happened at the meeting. I think from my perspective in participating there, um, it really highlighted the, the importance of the design of the system and how it must be practical and, and really be driven by real world values and requirements. And so, you know, highlighting the value tree analysis, business case development, uh, the importance of partnerships with indigenous peoples, and other residents of the Arctic, um, as well as, as other stakeholders, I think is critical. And that's something that I, I think shows the, the um, maturing uh, approach to the system design is we're really focusing on those, those why questions. Um, it seemed to me from, from seeing all of this, so that our real challenge will be in the implementation and, and we have many values and you know business priorities and so on that have been identified in these efforts so we need to think about you know how we're going to to select some of those and move those forward so arctic observing summit of course is a process came up that i think that was really critical um, and just generally strengthening strengthening our um, institutions as we go forward including you know um, the various international organizations arctic council and so on um, another thing I think that was highlighted um, by a number of people there was the importance of, of having a long-term vision, but really supporting that with tangible short-term achievements. Um, and that was sort of highlighted as, as needed um, from a political perspective to be able to, uh, to demonstrate you know, what's being done while we try and achieve this longer-term vision. Um, with respect to implementation, and I think related to that, um, the data system, which is the area I'm most familiar with, is part of this overall observing system, and I think the same rules apply there and, and were discussed, is it has to be, um, it has to serve 
the Arctic needs. But at the same time, in that case, it's really part of a larger global system, which is providing us with a lot of opportunities to leverage these, these broader uh, initiatives and systems, but also we're going to have some design considerations and sometimes maybe even constraints that we have to consider as we try and fit you know, the needs that, that we identify for the Arctic into this global uh, system. Um, overall, I thought it was a really, really productive day and, uh, and really showed, yeah, the maturity um, and the evolution of the conversation. Sorry, <laughs> I was on mute. Thanks to you both. And uh, for those summaries, we'll hold questions on, on this particular topic until we've hit the next bullet point as well. Um, so for a readout from the Science Forum um, itself, we've invited Larry Hensman and Martin Jeffries to share uh, their perspectives um, within the next 10 minutes, um, just to keep us on time, uh, in particular for anybody who might need to leave the call. We're going an hour and 15 minutes, but some people we realize might need to leave after an hour. Um, so Larry and Martin, if you could provide a summary of the science forum for us, please, thanks. Sure, um, Martin, do you wanna go first or should I? Sure, I'll go ahead. Um, I, I'm sure you'll have plenty to say to fill in the huge gaps I will leave. Um, but as described earlier by Sandy, uh, the Arctic Science Ministerial was a two-day event. Uh, day two was the political event, if you will, when the government delegations met. And Larry was in the room, I should add, at that meeting as the president of IASC. So Larry has a particularly interesting perspective, I think, on the entire two-day event, because Larry was also in the room at day one, the Arctic Science Forum. So the Arctic Science Forum brought together, I think, uh, close to 300 individuals um, as members of delegations, science delegations of all the countries the governments represented at the Arctic Science Ministerial, and there were representatives of um, Arctic Indigenous Peoples organizations at the Science Forum as well. Um, I would describe the purpose of the Science Forum as, say, twofold. One. Uh, was um, something of a retrospective on what had been achieved since the first Arctic Science Ministerial held um, on the White House grounds, the White House campus on uh, 28th of September 2016. And then it was a, a look forward, if you will, to the future, um, um, future directions, emerging opportunities, um, topics that, uh, that we, uh, subjects we can collaborate on, means to collaborate, and uh, so on. Um, it was, well, I think as a general statement, it's, it's reasonable to say it was very well organized. I thought it was a good structure to the day. Um, basically, um, it kicked off with a video uh, address from Chancellor Angela Merkel, the um, head of government in Germany, um, who was the patron of the certainly the Arctic Science Forum, but maybe Arctic Science Ministerial, the two-day event as a whole. Um, and then followed by some other dignitaries who were there in the room, Georg Schutter, the German science minister, and uh, people of that um, ilk and, and level. Um, and then there were three subsequent sessions addressing each of the three themes of the ministerial. And I won't um, give the titles for those themes. Um, but basically for each session, each theme, thematic session, there were two keynote speakers, and then there were somewhere between eight to 10 panelists um, who made up two panels in each uh, thematic session. And basically overall, what the organizers, which was the European Union, Finland, and Germany, what they strived to do and succeeded was that Every government or country, if you will, that was represented at the Arctic Science Ministerial um, had at least one speaker during the course of the Arctic Science Forum. So everybody was represented and had a chance to, uh, to speak about a different topic. Um, Sandy Starkweather was the first keynote speaker of the day in the first thematic session on Arctic observing infrastructure and data 
and Sandy talked about Arctic observing. And in that same thematic session, Peter Pulsifer, also on this call, Peter was a panelist, and he talked about um, data and data systems. And um, since this is an observing call, I would also add that Jan Rene Larson, the executive director of SEON, Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks, also gave a, a panel talk. Um, so ob Arctic observing and data, which we've all agreed some time ago, are um, integral to each other. They're very important to each other. You can't have one without the other. Um, Arctic observing and, and data were very well, very well represented and I would say very well spoken about, described um, at the Arctic Science Forum. Um, I'll stop there in the interest of time and in the interest of Larry having an opportunity to add anything um, that I've missed, which I'm sure I have. Well, there was there was a lot that happened, but that was a nice summary. Um, so I I can, can I try to share my screen. Can you see that right now? And Sandy's uh, on mute, but she's nodding, so I guess I'll assume that means yes. So. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, th thanks, Martin. That was that was wonderful. I guess I want to uh, say so. I was uh, I was on I was allowed to to uh, participate or attend the second day of the ministerial because I was on the organizing committee for the uh, for the Arctic Science um, Arctic Science Forum, and so the uh, the organizing committee, which was led by Karin Lochta and uh, Volker Rockel, did a lot of the work on it, and and Jenny Baseman really helped a lot too. Actually, put together the report that uh, that Sandy started out with. And um, there were, the, the key thing I think from this is that uh, there were three, three uh, sessions in the science forum, and those three sessions essentially paralleled the three sessions in the Arctic Science Ministerial, and also paralleled the three components of the joint statement that came out of the Arctic Science Ministerial. And so you can see one there is the uh, strengthening, integrating, and sustaining Arctic observations, which Martin uh, spoke so nicely about. And the second one was on the understanding of the regional and global dynamics of the Arctic change. Um, and so you can uh, you can see there was two panels in that also. Um, Marcus Rex gave the introductory keynote on that, and Osa Larson Blind gave a, the second from the uh, from the indigenous perspective, she's from the Sami Council, and then the third was the uh, was assessing vulnerability and building resilience of Arctic environments and societies. And I think the uh, the key thing I want to I want to say today is that so the the pre science forum which Sandy and Hayo so nicely organized and say on participated in organizing really fed into the uh, to the Science Forum, the Arctic Science Ministerial Science Forum, and the Science Forum really fed into the uh, to the Arctic Science Ministerial. So there was um, the three of us who uh, pre presented from each of these uh, sessions the results of that of uh, that session, and then I also really relied heavily upon the uh, the summary that Hyo prepared from the uh, the pre Arctic Science Ministerial for my, my particular presentation. Um, and then Karen Lochta gave the uh, the closing remarks, and so she had a really great presentation on just the the overall essence of it. And I think the important thing about the if you if you don't mind, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the the ministerial rather than the the, the science forum. And I think the the key component of the ministerial was that you know the there was really remarkable uniformity in the science forum going in as far as what the needs were and how we had to work together and that international collaboration was of essence. And then the ministers just essentially just echoed that through. Each of the ministers made a presentation and they just, it was essentially like a an, an echo chamber as far as it was the same message over and over and over again that uh, each minister just remarked how we, you know, this, how important the Arctic was, how essential Arctic observations were, how we had to invest in networks and observations, how process understanding was critical. And it, uh, I think the the important thing for the conversation today is that this this was a remarkable joint statement signed by these ministers of these uh, the eight Arctic nations and then 15 other nations and the uh, uh, European Union was represented there. The six indigenous um, peoples organizations were there, and this was a, a remarkable joint statement that we can use now to uh, to really push for. Uh, for moving ahead, for advancing the the Arctic observations, and I'm I'm a little disappointed in that I think this was such an important event, and then after the event it was just kind of dropped, and I'm I think we should really be really be uh, 
promoting this somehow and really pushing it forward so that not just, I think the United States is responding well. I, I'm not criticizing what's going on here. I think uh, NOAA, NASA, NSF are doing wonderfully with respect to Arctic observations. But I think we really have to utilize this, this uh, joint statement from all these other all these other organizations, all these other um, nations that have committed to it and really move it forward. And I just want to read one sentence out of the, uh, out of the uh, um, joint statement, which said that uh, we therefore intend to cooperate through the following actions, taking stock of progress made in the analysis of societal benefits of Arctic observations, continue and expand the cooperation in this area by progressively moving from the design to the deployment phase of an integrated Arctic observing system, which also supports and includes community-based observatories in cooperation with the Sustaining Arctic Observing Networks Initiative, Carpinicus, and other major operational observing networks, such as the Svalbard Integrated System. Um, so anyway, I think that, that's where I'll end, but I think that this is, uh, you know, the the onus is on us to really take this and run with it. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll stop and thank you. Thank you uh, both. That was, uh, oh, Martin, I'm sorry, go ahead. Could I just add a word about the joint statement? Um, Please. Thanks, Larry. That was a good summary. I appreciate it. Um, the, the joint statement was a, shall we say, a protracted effort to reach consensus among all the participating governments. Um, there were at least four drafts or iterations of the joint statement that every country um, was able to comment on, and including the United States. And we had a US working group for ASM2, comprising eight or eight or ten of us, um, and I would say that uh, that group played uh, an important role in the final uh, outcome of that uh, joint statement and um, some of the language, uh, including the observing um, language, and uh, also uh, the language about diversity and inclusion. Um, it would not have been there if it weren't for the United States um, insisting on particular words and phrases and sentences. Um, that's something that um, I think we can be we can be very pleased about. Um, but yeah, the, the joint statement, very important, valuable document, just like the joint statement from the first ministerial. Um, but um, how we take advantage of it um, to try and move things forward, uh, Larry raises a good point and uh, something worthy of discussion. Over. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, I, I think both of those concluding remarks are, are a great segue for what comes next. Uh, and I think many of the speakers who just described the, the science ministerial unders underscored this key tension between the need to continue our planning efforts and the need to really turn to implementation. And it was clear that the funding agencies and the science ministers are looking towards us as the research community um, to furnish them with, uh, with actionable um, and fundable plans. Um, Larry, if you could unshare your screen, we'll, I, I think that's a good point to, to turn towards uh, Roberto, uh, in particular for those members of the research community who uh, rely on, on funding from the National Science Foundation to move things forward to describe uh, the navigating the new Arctic. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Um, I have a few slides I can share, uh, which will just basically run through the components, the goals, and the tracks within the navigating the new Arctic. So I hope, let's see. Let's so I hope you can all see in first title slide, says navigating the new Arctic. Um, there's basically just kind of the aims of the this. This is a foundation-wide initiative, um, which with, with broad input from almost every single director except for math and physical sciences. Um, and it's really about tackling these convergent scientific challenges uh, within the rapidly changing Arctic. And there are also um, aims to basically inform um, some societal benefits, including economy, security, and resilience of both domestic and international regions. Um, and I, the Navigating the Arctic, or NNA, is a really broad initiative, uh, integrative, transformative, convergence research, um, and has a number of different layers and components. Uh, we have a Venn diagram on the right-hand side of the slide that sort of uh, is 
tries to illustrate integration across social systems, natural environment, and built environment. And within this framework, um, several on, on the left hand side, you can see several of the key components that have been identified by the foundation, different program uh, direct of program directors from directorates and divisions that are contributing to to the overall management and uh, implementation of this of this this program. And so um, you can see clearly, you know, the first key component um, is about innovations in Arctic observing. Uh, but we also want to you know, sort of basically fulfill other NSF goals, advancing research and education, of course, in the context of the Arctic, co-production of knowledge is obviously a very key component. And also, as I think, um, Arctic observing and networks, uh, both from a domestic and international standpoint, is, is really about building and enab enabling partnerships. So all these are gonna be key components. Um, to speak to specific goals of NNA, um, there's some language taken from, from the solicitation, uh, so I won't read everything, but just kind of highlight. Um, goals include improving understanding of Arctic change, certainly at different scales. Uh, which obviously are important for observations. And the key thing really is also about um, new approaches, uh, both for understanding processes and modeling. Um, again, with uh, there's a return here to, to the Venn diagram, particularly um, uh, with respect to interactions among these different domains of social, natural, and built environment. Um, another key goal of the N NNA is to really develop new, enhanced, diverse uh, research communities. So even looking beyond the traditional or, or familiar Arctic research community, looking at folks from outside the Arctic who have the expertise to really help understand and conduct research that uh, allows us to meet some of these goals. Um, and certainly, again, we're turning to sort of the, the societal benefits aspect. Um, hope is that research outcomes from those, those projects funded through NNA uh, help to inform U.S. national uh, priorities, including security and economic development, as well as enabling resilient and sustainable Arctic communities. So the way that NNA is structured is um, comprising through two different tracks. One is a research grant track. Uh, there's a $3 million budget limit for that with a maximum duration of five years. Um, and I'll return um, in the next slide or two to tell you some, about some of the focus areas that uh, the foundation is interested in exploring. And the second track is um, with respect to planning, planning grants. These are sort of coordinated activities um, with a, a, a much smaller uh, budget limit of only about a quarter of a million dollars for a maximum of, of two years. Um, and this is really about sort of developing new networks, new collaborations and partnerships, both internationally and with indigenous communities with respect to some higher or uh, higher level scope of, of, of activities. And I'll, I'll come back to that momentarily. Um, budget request uh, is $30 million a year. And the expectation is that this will continue for approximately five years. Uh, again, uh, pending availability of budget. And the deadline is February 14th. So with respect to the research grants, um, just a couple of sort of guidelines in the sense of um, some basic parameters that we uh, anticipate different investigators um, and their partners to, to propose, um, including obviously far reaching, creative proposals, um, tackling you know, mostly basic research, fundamental research, again, from a convergence uh, approach, um, but also including, you know, um, not just your basic science, but also engineering um, as they can apply to, to questions of the Arctic. Um, we really are expecting proposals to address at least, to address questions um, at the intersection of at least two of those uh, domains, natural environment, built environment, and social systems. Um, and again, uh, returning to that societal benefit framework, um, um, having a strong connection to real world needs, uh, as I think everyone is becoming um, evident to, to that to that need. Um, the particular areas of fo research focus areas that that the foundation has identified include the following. Again, sort of at the top of this list is Ar Arctic ob observational networks. That's really about innovations and technologies and instrumentation. Uh, and as Larry indicated, so that or Martin I think indicated, you know. Uh, um, uh, a direct connection with, with data collections, uh, both in uh, access to and management analysis and modeling efforts. Um, and the other four uh, focus areas you can read, but basically you focus on interdependent changes across different processes, natural, social, physical, et cetera. Uh, also looking uh, 
um, given that there is a, a uh, built infrastructure domain, a focus on science and engineering for sustainable, adaptive, and resilient infrastructure, um, as well as understanding, proving our understanding of relations between Arctic residents, national and cultural landscape, um, and also uh, more of the global consequence, influences and consequences, um, and opportunities arising from a changing Arctic, which also feels uh, sort of aligns with, with U.S. national policy and the, the national strategy for the Arctic region. Um, the planning grants, in turn, um, again, are, are a shorter duration, much smaller budget, and focus on supporting planning activities. Um, some of you might be familiar with research coordinate, coordinating networks, RCNs, and um, the Arctic Research Opportunity Solicitation has an RNA, which is a research networking activity. So these planning grants are sort of along the lines of that, uh, that premise, um, and really is designed to engage a broad, broad community of researchers, not just your sort of conventional Arctic scientists, but those who um, have other expertise that, uh, you know, is either applicable or transferable to, to understanding Arctic change. Um, and really, the goals of these planning grants are to develop these novel leading edge research ideas and approaches that integrate across, again, the three domains of the natural uh, environment, social systems, and built environments. Um, so this, this little, the last comment here on the slide at the bottom is about um, plan grants have the intent to help with the development of convergence research teams to tackle projects of larger scope in the future. This larger scope is as yet un, un, sort of defined. Um, there are discussions, preliminary discussions about what that could mean. Potentially it could refer to a center-like or consortium-like um, effort. Um, that has not yet been, been decided. Um, the other thing about the planning grants that I want to highlight is that, um, you know, really about integrating research across the three systems. These are some of the, the elements that we, we think would strengthen these planning grants. Uh, obviously, stakeholder and community engagement is, is, a, is a critical component of these types of proposals. Uh, research capacity building as well. Um, workforce development and training is, is an, another it was one of the important key components um, at, at the beginning of, of, the, of, my, of my briefing. Um, and we're also very interested uh, to, the extent, to the extent possible about the development and implementation of educational activities um, in concert with, with the research and planning grants. So you can see really that this is sort of broad scale, very integrative uh, convergence approaches. Um, there are many different think, types of questions that can be addressed through the NNA initiative. Um, this last second of the last slide also is about reminding uh, the community that um, projects are, are, are encouraged to include additional components uh, when appropriate and feasible uh, to advance education, workforce development, community resilience, and uh, different types of scientific and engineering leadership. So um, the way that we have initiated uh, sort of the, the handling or the management of, of proposals into the initiative is uh, by sending up this email alias, nna at nsf.gov. Uh, so folks who are interested in learning a little bit more about can send questions there. We also have this website, um, which I can actually have you can share that, um, which is basically the landing page for the initiative and includes, again, some basic information and specific link to the solicitation with all the eligibility requirements. There is a frequently asked questions document as well available um, that it should be the first sort of uh, pass for, for folks who are interested in, in, in submitting a proposal. If your question is not answered, then we highly encourage you to submit uh, an email to the, um, to the, to the email alias. So um, I'll stop there. And uh, if there's time, I can take any questions. Otherwise, um, I encourage everyone to explore uh, the, the web page or send their, their and you know, get a chance to read through the solicitation, the frequently asked questions. And if you still need additional information, uh, you can send an email to the alias. Great, Roberto, thank you so much for that overview. Um, so I've typed into the uh, chat, our, our next ag agenda item is a dialogue on mechanisms for generating greater US engagement um, and hopefully funded engagement under some of the topics we've just discussed. Um, and that could either be something that was proposed under navigating the new Arctic or other options. 
Um, and so this, we've left 20 minutes just to have a general discussion on that topic. And of course, we anticipated that people might have very direct questions about navigating the new Arctic as well. So the floor is open um, to begin. So Sandy, you um, mentioned at the very beginning this AGU pre-meeting that's about kind of building on the Arctic Observing Summit and Working Group 2 activities. I guess the question is, you know, are, are people who weren't directly involved in the Arctic Observing Summit or who haven't been previously involved in the working group, are they welcome to come to that, that meeting as well to start getting more engaged in this road mapping activity? Absolutely, yeah, thanks for the question, Sally. What we're doing under this working group too, I think is um, indicative of what HIO mentioned, this desire to turn AOS from less of a biennial meeting and into more of an ongoing planning process and coordination process um, under SEON. Uh, we're hoping that some of the other working groups follow suit and uh, or follow suit and and do the same um, but this is an opportunity to to really bring more people into the conversation who are interested in the conversation um, of course our topic is specific to uh, optimization and implementation but there there are other topics as well um, such as data that that Peter uh, has mechanisms for developing engagement around I'd, I'd like to pick up on something that, that Larry said. Um, Larry, I'd be interested in your, uh, your thoughts on how we can use that very strong statement that came out of the ministerial um, to sort of move things forward. Um, I mean, there was a similar statement that came out of the first ministerial. This one seemed even stronger and better coordinated, as you suggested. What, what are your thoughts and, um, and others about how we can actually use that leverage rather than sort of just be thinking having the same discussion too well i'm really uh i'm really pleased with the uh, the i don't know the synchronicity or the deliberate um planning that uh that navigating the new arctic came out at the same you know essentially the same time as this uh this joint statement i guess as far as this, this last year this latest release um so I think from the U.S. perspective, I think that we, you know, we really are on track. So I guess what I, what we are doing both through SEON, so there's uh, I guess 21 members, national members of SEON, and there's 23 national members of IASC, and we're really trying to get those member nations to identify the people who should be working on this and trying to get the uh, the correct individuals, the correct agency representatives to uh, you know, essentially put their money where their mouth is and step up to the responsibility that they've agreed to. And so we're, we're, we're working through those two organizations to try and get international collaborations. You know, I think uh, the, uh, that is what we can do in the background through IASC and through SEON. But I, you know, I think for the actual implementation, I think that what we have to do, at least for the, the Arctic Observing Network, there, the, there, there has to be a coordinated international planning effort behind this. And I think that uh, this, that Hayo and, and Sandy and, the, and Peter and, and everybody else who's helped on the Arctic Observing Summit has recognized that and moved that, that concept forward. And I think what I hope now is that in the next Arctic Observing Summit that's going to be held in, uh, in Iceland in, uh, 2000, in 2020, I hope that we can really utilize that as a platform necessary to go from you know, essentially from defining the roadmap to moving forward to actually making some progress towards the implementation. So that would, that's, that's the, uh, the stance I've taken in the last few weeks. And I hope that, uh, that the other members of the executive committee for the AOS will agree to that. Maybe I'll toss it back to Hio and see if, uh, and, and Sandy and see what you think about that. If I can, if I, I can just briefly respond to that. I mean, I, I, I think those are valid points. But one of the key challenges that requires clarity and good explanations to the broader community is that on the one hand, the ASM recognized that there needs to be more sort of agency level, national or international 
um, dedicated observing program efforts, you know, that in the U.S. would be, you know, would be NOAA, would be some of the other federal agencies who would be conducting that. But, but that then has to be complemented by what is currently a, you know, a very loosely structured at best um, effort on the part of, of the various research communities or academic communities or, or even federal research institutes in some of the other countries. And I, I think part of the challenge is that because there's these different types of efforts ongoing and because right now, at least in the U.S., both are, you know, let's put NNA aside, somewhat undersourced, you know, that, that, that is a bit of a challenge. In, in other countries, I, I see there quite a bit of, of investment into sustained observing, but as these countries ramp up, you know, China, Korea are, are good examples, but, but you, you would also include some of the European countries. Um, it, it would be important for them to have good clarity on where, where can they engage internationally um, so that, that the individual observations that they make just go much further than, than just what, what their individual contributions amount to. And somehow, I, I think that requires more communication. I, I feel we're, we're not all doing all that well. I mean, it gets back to the point that you're raising. I posted this as a question you know, there's a lot of good material submitted to the Arctic Science Ministerial, but as far as I'm aware, that sits behind a password wall on a fairly obscure German website, you know. And so if, if, you, if I can't even point colleagues to what, what's like 50 or 60 great documents that haven't been synthesized yet, you know, that, that makes it a bit more difficult to say, hey, you know, here, here are some of the things that you might want to have a look at. I am. Um... Hi, Owen. Oh, please go ahead, Martin. Thanks, Sandy. Um, just to uh, follow up on what you said, um, yes, the the original so-called deliverables documents submitted by each government participating in the second ministerial, I think, are behind that password protection at the ASN2 website. But there has been some synthesis of those documents, and that's all available in the report of ASM2. And I would certainly recommend everyone take a look at that to get at least some sense of the original deliverables documents. Jenny Baseman did a heroic job, I think, of synthesizing the information out of the um, original individual government documents. But I agree, it would be it would be good to be able to see the originals, to see the details of what individual countries um, uh, originally submitted as their commitments or deliverables. So Larry, I'd, you know, I I'd like to briefly pick up Larry's question um, and, and, and add my two cents to Hayo's response. I do think this key tension that came out of ASM was the uh, was this strong call from the ministers to get to work on on implementation? Um, I think that there we can't we can't obviously jump from where we are now to implementation because we are still missing a few pieces in between. This concept of the roadmap, you know, the the two things a roadmap does is to say where are we going and what specific actions are we going to take to get there i think we've i think we've got a really clear sense of or i shouldn't say clear sense i think we have a very high level sense of where we need to go i don't think that we have done a a, a, a clear enough job of outlining the actions that we need to take to get there and i think hayo gave some really good examples of where that lack of um actionable next steps can leave some people kind of on the outside not knowing how to engage. I think this is really what we need to focus on in the year ahead, uh, both through, say on, through extending the AOS into a process, through developing the kinds of proposals people could potentially put into something like navigating, um, these 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 are kind of RCN style um, pieces might be useful ways for smaller or newer communities to say let's come together and decide what we need to do next but then there's sort of a meta structure where these 
individual communities also need to be stitched together at that at that say on AOS level. And, and, and we need some people to be operating around the big picture as well. Um, so I think that while there is an intense urgency uh, to implement and deploy observations, I, I don't think we can neglect that our planning still needs some focus. The one thing I'd like to add to that too is that uh, the other challenge for us is that uh, in those reports that Martin was just addressing, you know, each of the nations talked about essentially what they were doing, but those are all from their national priorities or their, their, what, what are their, in their best nation's best interest. And so they, they don't necessarily stitch together as, as completely and as, as continuously as we need. And so that's a, that's a huge challenge for, for us to overcome. And so that's the other aspect that we're, we're going to need to deal with to, uh, to actually move to, uh, to implementation. But, but if, I, if I may just briefly chime in on that, but that is a, is a great opportunity though, and that's why I feel those documents are so, the, the raw documents are so valuable because the, 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 the chance that we have is that there are some themes that are, that are starting to emerge as being mature enough, as being at the intersection of national interests defined by the different countries and research areas where, where you, you have significant innovation available to draw on and, and somebody, and, and that arguably is, is part of what this AO, modified AOS process would have to do, but ideally with, with help from other entities as well, would, would have to sort of identify a few of those areas where, where there is already some connectivity and pull those together and then make that much more accessible than it is now so that people in the research community, people with different agencies, you know, and not just in the US, I mean, in, 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 in all these other countries, know exactly how to latch on to that and become part of it and make it work both for their benefit, but in, in, at the same time contribute to, to the bigger bigger picture. That, that I, I would argue, is, is doable, but, but it, it's going to require some effort. Let's take that as an action uh, to try to see what we can do about releasing more information from the deliverables documents and see what other questions might be out there related to uh, navigating the new Arctic or our other topics today. Uh, it's Vladimir here. I have a question to Larry. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, is as usual already, um, Russia is a problem, right, in terms of international collaboration and so. And uh, it may be uh, adventures that next meeting of IASC will be in Russia, but unfortunately there will be no EOS. What, uh, what IASC is planning in terms of involving or, well, um, asking questions at least, uh, what Russia is planning in terms of international collaboration and solving not their national you know, kind of uh, priorities, but also allowing um, international researchers to be involved in this. Thanks. So you, you're, you are correct. And so the, the next uh, Arctic Science Summit Week will be held in Arkhangelsk in uh, May of 2019. And um, well, first I'll back up to the Arctic Science Ministerial. So, so Russia did participate there and they were very actively engaged. And I, at, after following the Arctic Science Ministerial, Ambassador uh, Vladimir Barbin participated in the Arctic Council. And I did speak with him with respect to the, to the joint statement and about continuing to contribute to, uh, to and shared observations. And of course he was saying all the right things. Um, so I think, I don't know, we can, we can either say they're saying the right things or the intention is there. It's, it's a little hard to distinguish. I, I don't think, you know, I'm a little concerned that the next Arctic Science Ministerial is not, I'm sorry, I'm, I don't think that the next Arctic Science Summit Week, which will be in our Congress in May, I don't think that's the right forum for this conversation. And so I was actually, I was just thinking about uh, the, uh, the, what is that called? The, the uh, Arctic Forum of, or mm. Continuity of Dialogue or, or what is that? The, 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 the something on dialogue that's um, going to be held in Arkhangelsk in April. And I think I'm going to go to that because that is where the high level politicians actually go. And that's the, 
that's the meeting where we can actually make progress on this. And so I, 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 I think, you know, if I can make rearrange my schedule slightly, I think I will plan on attending that and, and we will continue to push on Russia for their engagement and participation. Hmm. So we have, is Martin. Oh, I just wanted to say we Paul Berkman put a, a question in the chat. Maybe if we could, uh, Martin, were you going to speak directly to Larry's comment or uh, was it a new question? No, I did have something uh, to add to what Larry was saying, if I may. Okay. Um, so at the, the final page of the ASM2 joint statement, um, there is a suggestion that um, there be an Arctic Science Funders Group, an informal group of the research funding agencies or the science funding agencies in the different countries to, to at least informally share information um, as part of moving, advancing knowledge and understanding of the changing Arctic and, and the joint work that needs to be done collectively to to, to do that. Um, so somebody needs to step forward and take the lead on that um, to take advantage of that statement in the joint statement. And perhaps that could be the United States. Um, ultimately, NSF um, led the US preparations for the Arctic Science Ministerial, the second one. And um, of course, the head of the US delegation to the second ministerial was uh, Franz Cordova, the NSF director. Um, so per perhaps NSF might be willing to take on the responsibility to, to get this Arctic funders uh, effort underway. I think they would, NSF, the United States, would find strong support from the European Union, or more specifically, the European Commission. Um, that idea of a funders group um, in the joint statement from Berlin is due to the European Commission, but I would, I would add, and I don't think um, I'm wrong to do so, that um, they, they took the idea from the United States um, from way back in 2016. So there's an opportunity for the European Commission and the US to perhaps uh, work jointly to to really get the idea of a, an informal funders group and discussion moving. Because that's essential, not the least, to moving observing forward in a collective fashion. Thanks, Martin. Paul, do you want to come off mute and, and ask your question? Unmute, For, unmute, uh, there we go. There you are. So, some people don't have uh, access to the chat. A uh, question relates to the uh, discussions, of, any discussions about the Arctic Science Agreement at the Arctic Science Ministerial. Um, I've talked with Martin many times in the past, pre previous to the uh, Arctic Science, second Arctic Science Ministerial, and, and view the Arctic Science Agreement as something that would benefit from that international dialogue going forward and wonder whether the Arctic Science Ministerial itself um, is an appropriate venue to convene the dialogues among the Arctic and non-Arctic states in, a, in an inclusive manner. Um, and also with regard to the observing systems, um, in a sense, they're an element of built infrastructure and the, the combination of the governance mechanisms and the built infrastructure uh, to achieve sustainability need to be coupled. And so these types of discussions, um, I think, will bring Seon and uh, th this type of discussion today into a, into a, into a, uh, a framework where the Seon is part of built infrastructure going forward. So, so I'll, I'll jump in there. So that, that's an interesting question, Paul. And so, you know, yes, Paul knows well, the, uh, the Arctic Science Agreement was uh, an agreement by the, uh, through the Arctic Council among the eight Arctic nations 
and so they were they agreed to it the other the non arctic nations can benefit from it if they partner with the arctic nations and so at the uh, arctic science ministerial i don't recall even a single word about the arctic science ministerial i'm sorry at the arctic science ministerial i don't recall a single word about the arctic Sci about the arctic science agreement however the, the arctic council senior arctic officials meeting was held about the next week in uh, Rovaniemi, Finland. And there was a uh, substantial discussion, mainly on the sidebars, but also slight discussion during the, the actual meeting about the implementation of the Arctic Science Agreement and, and the, uh, the roles of the, you know, the, the uh, points of contacts among the nations. And so, um, you know, it'd be good to have a follow-up on that conversation with uh, with the U.S. delegate, the U.S. senior article official uh, Julie Gurley, she was she was there and and participated in some of those discussions. Most of those were informal and on the side. So, you know, I think uh, what the Arctic Council is doing is essentially is, is is it seems like is is letting it run for a bit and seeing how it works out. Sandy, it's Martin. If I could just add that there was little or no mention of the. Um, Arctic Council facilitated science cooperation agreement and I think that was quite deliberate on the part of the organizers because there's a lot of unhappiness amongst the non-Arctic states that nevertheless have considerable Arctic research presence at not being signatories to that agreement that it was limited to the Arctic 8 although it's not an Arctic Council agreement um, so no mention of it and and this, this also relates to why the, the ministerials, as they're becoming, uh, first with the White House ministerial and now the, the second ministerial in Berlin, why they, um, they do include the non-Arctic non countries that have a, a considerable interest and in activity in Arctic research, that um, we can't limit this effort to the Arctic Eight. Um, we need to be inclusive. Uh, of, of as many as possible. It's along am, those lines. Mark. I apologize. I feel like the radio host whose music is being cued in the background. Um, we have come to the uh, end of our time and about five minutes past. I do have another phone call, um, but Meredith's the one who has this line open. Um, and, and if others are interested in continuing the dialogue, I think we could stay on a few more minutes uh, with myself having to leave. Um, I just wanted to take a minute to thank everybody. I think there's, there, there is a tremendous amount of interest in this topic. I realize some people on the call are maybe approaching this with a, a different capacity or, or uh, without so much background. And so hopefully this was beneficial to you. I think you know who to reach out to for more information. Um, as I mentioned, our next meeting is going to be a, a live live broadcast at AGU. Um, hopefully, you guys can join us uh, there. We'll have some announcements coming out ahead of time. Um, thank you to our speakers uh, for your contributions, and apologies for having to sign off, but please do continue the dialogue as it's useful. Okay, um, well, it looks like people are signing off, but if there are any more questions, feel free to ask them. Oh, Martin, I just wanted to, um, is Martin still here? Yes, Martin's still here. I just wanted to follow up just on one thing briefly, and, and maybe we can take this up more at uh, the next meeting at, at AGU. Um, as, as Larry knows, and Sandy, who is gone, um, we've been trying to get uh, countries to contribute their fair share to, to say on, uh, both monetarily and, and also just um, in, in kind. Um, and so I'm wondering whether the, your Arctic funding um, idea and what came out of the ministerial uh, couldn't somehow be wedded on to uh, SEAN or come under the auspices of SEAN, because there already is the international organization uh, through SEAN, and it, it might be the vehicle um, that could move your, uh, you know, your, uh, the funding, um, the Arctic funding group forward. Just well, I think the, the idea of the Arctic funding group is you know, it's much broader than Arctic observing. As important as Arctic observing and expanding that capability is, um, the idea of the funders group is to be much more Catholic, if you will, in terms of um, coverage and, and of the broad scope of uh, Arctic science, as described, for example, in the ministerial themes and the deliverables. 
Um, so I, I, I would view as much as Arctic observing is important and say on is important and say on success through being seen to be useful and productive. Um, I think the funders group uh, is getting that rolling to, to serve Arctic science and actually technology engineering and mathematics more broadly uh, is equally as important. And it can then, under that umbrella, be hopefully helping SEON and, and the um, expansion of our Arctic observing capabilities. Okay, that, that, that's a good uh, you know, points well taken. I'm wondering then whether this shouldn't be something, given your experience, you can come on this, that ought to come out of OSTP. Um, would, would that be a place to, uh, from the U.S. point of view, to start pushing this? Um, I, ha I will have to be very careful about what I say. Um, I think the short answer is um, begin with NSF and then let NSF and the other relevant agencies working together through IOPIC, um, pursue this topic and um, seek the advice of OSTP and, and determine even, you know, if OSTP wants to take the lead. Um, you know, I, OSTP, handed, OSTP handed over responsibility for US participation in the Arctic Science Ministerial, the second one, handed that over to NSF. Um, and, and so, but IOPIC is still part of OSTP, of course, through the National Science and Technology Council. And so we do have uh, ways to uh, engage with OSTP and keep them informed and even try to encourage them to become more engaged. But um, uh, the politicals at OSTP tread very carefully, shall we say. Martin, this is Sally. I wonder if this is something we could also discuss um, on USA on, since that's a federal only, you know, group. Maybe it's something we could get a little traction there on how to bring this idea up further up the chain. Yes, good idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are there any more questions? Sounds like not. So thank you everyone for joining and um, I will post this recording and the notes as soon as I can. Yeah, on behalf of our group and Sal and Sandy, uh, uh, thanks a lot for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you everyone. Yeah, thanks everybody, bye. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye.